Hello, I'm Laura Bennett with German with Laura, and this is my ninth video in a 10 part series on how to learn German smarter, not harder. In this video, we're going to talk about German word order. How are sentences correctly structured in German? There are patterns that work and patterns that don't. And as you will discover, there are some word order patterns that German uses that we do not have equivalents for in English. It's super important to understand these German and patterns because one, you're going to come across them all the time. And two, if you don't understand what's really happening in the sentence and you just interpret the sentence through an English lens, you will misunderstand what is being said. And dependent upon the context, dependent upon how high the stakes are, this could have catastrophic results. So in this video, which does stand alone, by the way, if you haven't watched the other videos in this series, don't worry about it. You can catch up on those later. In this video, I'm going to introduce you the standard sentence structure used in German and then the top way that we make some particular tweaks that we don't have in English uh, to then create a second very commonly used sentence structure in German. As usual, we're going to start by looking at some English sentences first in order to set the stage for this topic. Here we go. In video five in this series, which, by the way, if you need some extra practice with the concepts of nominative, accusative, dative cases, click the link above my head and watch that video perhaps first and then come back to this one. In that video, number five in this series, we saw these sentences, the woman sings, the woman sings a song, the woman sings her little baby a song. And if we do what I call a slot analysis of these sentences, this is what we're working with. The subject of the sentence is the woman, and the subject always has to go into the nominative case. This is the same in English and in German, okay? Then after you have the subject noun identified and correctly put into the nominative case, notice that it's always the verb that comes next. There's going to be more on this important principle shortly. After that, while we could just stop at sentence number one, this is still a complete sentence. We have a subject, we have a verb, done. We can add additional information if we want to. And that brings us to option number two, where now we're answering the question, what is the woman singing? And the answer is she is singing a song. And this what, a song, is the direct object in this sentence. And direct objects have to go into the accusative case. In the third sentence here, we still have a song playing the role of the direct object, so still in the accusative case, but now we've also added in the additional element of to whom is the song being sung by the woman, and that to whom is her little baby, which makes it the indirect object in this sentence, and indirect objects always go into the dative case. So, like we talked about in video five, that gives us three basic sentence patterns. In each one of these, we have the subject coming first, the nominative case, followed by the verb, which we can say is in position two in the sentence. And then if we add the accusative, that comes next. Or if we add the dative, that has to be inserted in between now the nominative case and the accusative case. So there are two rules that I want you to understand about these three basic sentence patterns. The first rule is that the nominative and the verb have to be next to each other. And you can see that here, right? In these instances, the nominative is always first and the verb is always next, so they are right next to each other. The second rule is that the verb always has to be in the second position in the sentence. And notice, this is so important, that the verb is not necessarily the second word in the sentence because the nominative case, that nominative slot, could contain many, many words in it, right? The subject of the sentence might be the, the kind, rich man that I just met yesterday. That would all be in the nominative case, that all of those words comprise the subject of the sentence. And then after that, in position to would come the verb. Okay. These exact same patterns function exactly the same way in German. We have die Frau, who is the subject of the sentence each time, the woman. Okay, nominative coming first. Then we have our verb, 
right next to it, right next to it, right next to it. And in all of these instances, the verb is in position to, right? Or it is the second element in the sentence coming after the nominative case, which in this instance is comprised of two words, the and Frau, okay? Then, just like in English, if we want to add additional information in sentence two, then we answer the question, what is being sung? And the answer is ein Lied, a song. And that is playing the role of the direct object in the sentence. And direct objects always go into the accusative case. Great. And so then in the third sentence, we have the same thing. We still have ein Lied, still the direct object, still in the accusative case. But now we've added that third element of to whom the song is being sung or who is the recipient of the song or being benefited by the song. Those are all ways to think about the dative case here. And so ihrem kleinen Baby goes into the dative case. It is the indirect object in this sentence. Okay, so now the question is, what happens in English if we move these slots around in the sentence? What if we change the order and it's no longer nominative, verb, dative, accusative, like in our standard sentence? Does that work in English? So the first sentence, right, is the standard sentence we've been working with, nominative, followed by the verb, which is in the second position. So the nominative and the verb are right next to each other. Those are our two rules. And then we have the indirect object in the dative case and the direct object in the accusative. Great, okay, so we're gonna put a, a check mark by this. That's our original sentence. That's the meaning we still want to convey in sentence two and sentence three. In sentence two, we say, her little baby sings the woman a song. Right, we still have all the same elements, they've just traded places. And this sentence still makes sense, I guess, but it doesn't mean the same thing as sentence number one. So we're gonna give that a question mark, okay? Then what about sentence three? A song sings the woman her baby, huh? This doesn't even make sense in English. This straight up doesn't work. The reason why we cannot shuffle these elements around in an English sentence is because the cases themselves are fixed in English. The first noun in a standard sentence in English is always going to be the subject of the sentence, always taking the action with that verb coming next. And then if we have two additional nouns in this kind of setup, it's always going to be the next one that will be the dative case, and then the third one that will be the accusative case, right? So the cases themselves have to stay in the same order, and if you change the contents of the slot, you change the meaning of the entire sentence in English. But in German, this is completely different. Okay, so here are the exact same translations of those three sentences, but now in German. Check it out. Our standard sentence, right, with the nominative case first, die Frau, subject of the sentence, what is she doing? She's singing. The verb is in second position. That's rule number two. The subject noun and the verb are right next to each other. That's our rule number one. Then what is she singing? She's singing a song. So that goes into the accusative case as the direct object. To whom is she singing? She's singing to her little baby. The indirect object goes into the dative case. Okay, so now look at it this way. If that's our first sentence, okay, we got our check mark. That's what we want. Now we have ihrem kleinen Baby coming first in the sentence, still followed by the verb in position two, that's our second rule, and now on the other side of that verb, the nominative case, so that we're still fulfilling rule number one of the verb and the nominative being next to each other, and then after that, the song, okay? And then in the third sentence, now we're leading off with the song, still followed by the verb in the second position, and then followed by the nominative case so that the subject noun and the verb are still right next to each other, and then after that, the indirect object in the dative case. The thing is, all three of these sentences mean the exact same 
thing, okay? And how is that possible? That is possible because of the declensions on the words coming in front of the nouns in each of these slots, okay? So the declension here and the declensions here and here, the lack of declension here, they are all the same in all three of these sentences. And that is why in German we can move the elements around in the sentence. We can change the word order without changing the meaning. In English, we saw how the cases themselves stayed the same. It was always the pink, pink, pink for the nominative case, and then orange, orange, orange for the dative case, and yellow, yellow, yellow for the accusative case. But here, the cases themselves moved, right? In sentence number one, the dative case is the second one. Here it's the first one. Here it's the third one, right? And the same thing with the pink and the yellow. They all changed position, but because of those declensions, we still know who is who and what is what. And this is so crucial in German. If you haven't already watched the video in this series in which I talk about declensions, that's video six. You might want to watch that after this video for some additional information on that specific topic. Okay, so with those German examples fresh in our head, where we're mixing all of the slots around in the sentence, let's analyze what it is we were looking at. Okay, so we still have these three basic sentence patterns with the nominative first, then the verb in the second position, and then the accusative or the dative cases being optionally added after that, just dependent upon what you want to say. We can take these three basic patterns and we can combine them into one principle that looks like this. This is the standard sentence structure in German. So this is standard word order in German, where we have the nominative coming first, the very first element in the sentence. It has to be next to the verb, right? And the verb also has to be the second element in the sentence. So this standard sentence structure, standard word order in German fulfills both of those rules that we were looking at earlier. And now coming after the verb, we have options. It could be an accusative case, whether that's a direct object or it's a prepositional phrase in the accusative case. It could be a dative case, whether it's an indirect object or it's a dative prepositional phrase. It could be an adverb. It could be multiple adverbs. We can also have multiple accusative cases or dative cases, but all of those elements all come next after the verb in what we can call position number three in the sentence. And this is important because like we were just seeing with those German sentences where the cases moved around to different slots, starting from this standard sentence pattern, we can now create a new sentence pattern called a transposed sentence pattern. Right, so what's happening here? Our verb is still in the second position. The nominative, however, moved from being the very first element in the standard sentence to now being here, right after the verb. So it's still next to the verb, but it's on the, the other side of the verb now. And with all of these elements that are in what we'll call position three, we can take one of them at a time and put it at the beginning of the sentence, transpose it to the beginning of the sentence. Why does German do this? German does this to emphasize that element. In English, when we emphasize something, we do it with our voices, we do it with our intonation to say, I'm flying to Germany tomorrow, not next week, not in a month, I'm going there tomorrow, right? But in German, you would put the tomorrow at the beginning of the sentence and then keep your voice pretty much the same in order to convey the same thing. Or I'm flying with my whole family to Germany, right? We use our voice in English to say that, but in German, again, they would take the with my family and put that at the beginning of the sentence and then keep their voice pretty much the same, but still emphasize it like that. And in, an, in English, we can't do that. We can't say with my family, I am flying to Germany tomorrow, unless you want to sound very pretentious or possibly a little bit like Yoda, okay? So let's look at how this transpose sentence pattern works in German, although again, we do not have an appropriate equivalent in English. Okay, so speaking of flying to Germany, here's that very sentence. If we do a slot analysis of this, this is a standard sentence. 
I, nominative pronoun, subject of the sentence, put into the nominative case, comes first in the sentence. It is followed by the verb, so they're right next to each other, that's rule number one, and the verb is in position two, which is rule number two. After that, all the rest of this information here is all number three, position number three, or all the third elements in the sentence, okay? We can further analyze these elements as being an adverb right here, and then we have two dative cases because we have two dative prepositions, okay? When I have a video put out on prepositional phrases, I'll put a link here above my head for it, okay? So, again, translated in English, I am flying to Germany with my family tomorrow. And if we wanted to emphasize one of those aspects, we would use our voice. I'm flying to Germany with my family tomorrow. I'm flying to Germany with my family tomorrow. I'm flying to Germany with my family tomorrow, right? We use our voice to accomplish that emphasis. But in German, we're going to see how instead we transpose the element we want to emphasize. So one more time, analyze our standard sentence here, nominative verb, and then in position number three, we have an adverb and two dative case slots. All right, great. So now the first change that we can make, these are in an arbitrary order, by the way, but we can take this adverb morgen, which means tomorrow, and we can emphasize that by transposing it to the front of the sentence. So now, morgen is the first element in the sentence, still followed by that verb, and then on the other side of the verb, the nominative case, because it has to be next to the verb, and then after that, we take the rest of the elements that were for, from position three and still include them in the same order that they originally occurred in, right? We just moved Morgan, but everything else in the third position of the sentence stays in the same order that it was. All right, so now we can transpose another element from position three. We can take nach Deutschland. We can put that now at the front of the sentence. That's what we're emphasizing. We still have the verb coming next in the second position. It's still followed by the subject, the nominative case after that. And now we have the remaining contents of that third position in the sentence. We have our adverb, and then we have the other dative slot, mit meiner Familie. Then finally, we can transpose mit meiner Familie to the front of the sentence, keeping the verb in the second position and then following it now with the nominative case so that the subject noun and the verb are still next to each other. We're still following both of our rules. And then we have the remaining elements from the third position in the sentence that are still there. So the thing to note about this is that however many elements you have in the third position of the sentence, we have one, two, three, you have the same number of variations on the sentence that you can create in German. You have three different ways that you can transpose the elements from the third position in the sentence to have three additional options, right? One, two, three. If we had 10 elements in position three, we could create 10 different sentences where one at a time we're transposing them to the front of the sentence in order to emphasize them. Okay, so I know this is a really, really big topic, but again, so crucial because Germans use transposed word order all the time, so you really need to know what is going on with this. So if you want some additional practice, click in the description below, open up the link in a new tab to my free English Grammar for German Learners course where you can get lots of additional practice doing similar slot analysis of where's the subject noun, where's the direct object, where's the indirect 
object? Is this an adverb? What's happening? Okay, do that. And then also below in the description, you can open up a, a tab to read an article on my website where I've written about German word order. What are the sentence structures used in German? I've written on this at length, getting into even more patterns than what I talked about here in this video. And then in this series, in videos five and six, you can watch those videos if you haven't already to learn more about how I introduced the case system and the concept of declensions, etc. And now at this point, you need to choose. Do you want to continue the series watching video 10 where I give you my best study tips? Or would you like to take this opportunity to start the series from the beginning? Either way, I will see you in that video next.